From the Normandy beaches to the doorstep of the Third Reich, American GIs fought alongside Allied troops for every inch of turf, fighting to free France from Hitler and the Nazis. These are the shootouts that help free Europe and win the war. Moment by moment and shot by shot, lightning raids and bloody street combat. Shootout, storming France. D-Day, June the 6th, 1944, 8.30 a.m. Le Grand Chemin, three miles inland from the American invasion beach, codenamed Utah. Lieutenant Dick Winters of E Company 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne, was called forward to take out a German gun battery that was pulverizing Utah Beach. Those guns could shower that beach landing area with 105 millimeter high explosive firepower. And because of that, those guns had to be captured. After parachuting into Normandy only hours earlier, the men of Easy Company were still scattered, and Winters had only 11 others from his platoon close by. A volunteer from another company brought the total for the initial assault force up to 13 men. They were highly trained, but untested. A band of brothers awaiting their rendezvous with destiny. Four huge German 105 howitzers were cut into a hedgerow along an open field, connected by a series of trenches about 400 yards long. An entrenchment with riflemen and a machine gun post protected the flank to the north. Across a field, several hundred yards behind the guns, three MG42 machine guns manned by elite German paratroopers guarded the whole setup. In total, 50 to 60 German soldiers occupied the defenses. Winters ordered his men to lighten their loads by dropping any non-essential gear. Basically, if it couldn't kill Germans, it was left behind. Winters would attack the battery from the only side that made sense, the lightly defended right flank. Once in the entrenchment, he'd use double envelopment to knock out the guns one by one as his assault force swept south. After positioning his machine gunners to provide suppressing fire, he sent Sergeants Carwood Lipton and Mike Rainey off to the right with orders to send rifle fire into the rear of the gun battery. Winters then split his remaining force taking three men with him while assigning Lieutenant Buck Compton to move in closer with Sergeants Bill Garnier and 22-year-old Don Malarkey. He then ordered me to go across a, an area of about 35 yards towards the hedgerow area where these guns were located. On the flank, Sergeant Lipton climbed a tree to get a better view and readied his carbine. With his men in place, Winters kick-started the attack with a small arms barrage. With the German defenders absorbed by the frontal attack, he aimed his folding stock M1A1 carbine and turned the battlefield into his personal shooting gallery. He unloaded two magazines into the German flank from 75 yards. As the firing continued, Compton charged across the field towards the German defenses. You couldn't see the guns. You couldn't see the trench. And when Buck Compton ran across this open area, he dropped in the trench without even knowing that was there. And when he did that, he landed and his weapon jammed. He spotted a German soldier. Luckily for him, Malarkey and Garnier were very close behind. They laid down fire that killed that German and Lieutenant Compton was able to clear the jam. Not a great way to begin an attack. But at that same moment, Winters and his group charged into the battery, lobbing grenades and spewing bullets. 
The double envelopment took the Germans by surprise. One of the artillery gunners was killed at his post. The rest of the crew fled across the open field. Twenty seconds into the attack, and the first gun was in American hands. As the enemy continued to flee, Compton pulled the pin on a Mark II fragmentation grenade. The Germans were initially surprised. The Germans initially didn't know the strength of the force that they were up against, the direction that the assault was coming from. But don't let that fool you. The Germans ultimately put up a very, very fierce fight over these guns. One Nazi gunner hit Private Popeye Wynn in the backside. Then a German grenade dropped into the trench, right between Corporal Joe Toy's legs. And Lieutenant Winters and Lieutenant Compton called out grenade, and Toy was able to flip over to avoid it. The German paratroopers in the far hedgerow spotted Lipton in his tree and zeroed in. With bullets dicing the leaves around him, Lipton jumped down from the branches and ran to safety. Along the northern end of the defense, more Germans retreated across the open field. By turning their back toward the Americans assaulting the guns, the Germans were, of course, basically signing their own death warrant. One by one, the men were cut down. Somehow, one of the Germans was still alive and screaming for help. Compton ordered Sergeant Malarkey to finish him off with a shot to the head. It's an unfortunate consequence of war that as wounded men crawled away, they had to be killed. It was just a, simply a very, very ugly, but at the same time important matter of denying the Germans the one thing that was the greatest use to them, personnel, manpower. Farther down the trench, a two-man German machine gun crew prepared to counter-attack. Crawling forward, Winters caught them prepping their weapon and killed them. At the same time, an American GI was spotted running across the open field behind the gun battery. Even the German machine gunners didn't know what to make of it, and they withheld fire, thinking the man was a medic. But this was no medic. It was Sergeant Malarkey. So without thinking, I went running out in that field, gonna get myself a souvenir. He had spotted a holster on a dead German that he was sure contained a much sought after Luger pistol. And as I knelt down, why, Dick Winters yelled at me, get, get out of there, there are Germans all over the place. Call me an idiot. Malarkey discovered that the souvenir he'd just risked his life for wasn't a Luger at all. Even worse, the machine gunners in the nearby hedge had decided he was fair game. Malarkey ran like hell back to the trench near the captured gun. Pinned down next to a dead German, with bullets pinging off the howitzer just above him, this trench could have become his early grave. From the other side of the hedge, Sergeant Garnier shouted to him to time the incoming machine gun bursts. And then he said, the next time you hear a shot coming in, why, well, jump up and run. I didn't have far to run, I just had to roll over to where he was. And I got out of there without being hit. Winters then led another double envelopment attack against the second gun position. Stunned by the speed and ferocity of the assault, the Nazi artillerymen evacuated down the trench. Two of the four guns were taken. As the Americans started to take prisoners, one sadistic GI whipped out a 1918 trench knife with brass knuckles built into the handle. He hit this prisoner full blast on the side of the face. He had to bust his jaw in a thousand places. Buck Compton yelled at the guy and said, what do you mean doing that? I said, this, that, that's a violation of the Geneva Convention. If we get out of here, I'm gonna get you court-martialed. According to Malarkey, Compton didn't have a chance to make good his threat. 
The soldier who had used the brass knuckles was killed in the trenches. The third gun was 50 to 100 yards away. For the attack, Winters decided to swarm in from three sides rather than just two. John Hall, a soldier from another company, wanted in on the action, so Winters deployed him straight down the trench. Compton and Garnier advanced up the right and Winters took the left. Hall was cut down with a mortal wound as he neared the gun, but the assault raged on. Displaying the reckless bravery that earned him the nickname Wild Bill, Sergeant Garnier mowed down several Nazi artillerymen with his Tommy gun. Six others surrendered in the face of the onslaught. The gun was captured. Near the third gun, Winters discovered a German map showing the locations of machine gun nests and artillery batteries throughout the Normandy Peninsula. He sent this vital intelligence back to battalion headquarters. Winters then had his men destroy the captured guns with TNT and hand grenades. Reinforcements arrived in the form of a five-man team, led by Lieutenant Ronald Spears of D Company. Two volunteers from F Company, Len Hicks and Rusty Hook, came too. Hicks and Hook established positions along the hedge fronting the fourth gun. Hook reached up to throw a grenade, unaware of the German machine gun to his rear. It tore into his back and shoulders. He was dead before he hit the ground. Taking revenge, Lieutenant Spears jumped into the trench, his Tommy gun blazing. D-Day, June the 6th, 1944, Le Grand Chemin, France, 11.15 a.m. A dozen men from the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment had destroyed three guns in a four-gun German battery that was menacing Utah Beach. Only one gun was left to be taken. Lieutenant Ronald Spears of D Company jumped into the trench, Tommy gun blazing. The Nazi gun crew was in no mood for dying, and they abandoned their position. All four guns had been silenced. Eleven thirty a.m. With their objective achieved, Lieutenant Dick Winters decided to pull his men back. As he climbed out of the trench, the lieutenant saw a wounded German mustering the strength to aim his machine gun. Winters hit him through the head. The bloody assault of the guns on Braycourt Manor had come to an end. Four men had been lost, two wounded. But the guns had been captured, 15 Germans killed and 12 taken prisoner. For Winters, it was a masterful display of leadership. Winters closed with the enemy, engaged them at close quarters and destroyed them. He did exactly what an infantry platoon leader in combat is supposed to do. Grania, France, 15 miles south of Braycord Manor, 10 a.m. As Winters and his men were jumping into the trenches at Braycourt, the men of 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne, were still trying to get orientated after one of the worst misdrops of any parachute regiment on D-Day. More than 150 paratroopers wandered through marshy terrain towards the small village of Granier, 16 miles south of their intended landing zone. The Americans had received new orders to hold the strategically located village as part of an effort to block any German forces moving towards the coast. Commanding officer Major Charles Johnson told his men to dig in. Surrounded by German forces, well behind German lines, they have basically nowhere that they can go. They were going to have to stay and fight with the weapons, the equipment, and the ammunition that they had available to them right then and there. Aided by local villagers, American troops created a defensive ring around Granier. In the cemetery, two mortar pits were dug. They were linked by a field phone to an observer in the church bell tower. 
Having eyes in the sky was a crucial tactical advantage. It gave the paratroopers in Glenya this incredible capability of throwing an 81 millimeter high explosive round at basically anything that they could see. Along a hedgerow south of town, 22-year-old Sergeant John Hinchliffe manned one of the unit's five M1919 A430 caliber machine guns. Extremely effective weapon. Uh, I, I used it for two solid years through four campaigns. Uh, the, the weapon uh, never jammed, uh, uh, killed a lot of krauts with the thing. June the 11th, 10 a.m. On D-Day plus five, German troops heading towards the coast reached the outskirts of Granier. It was Sunday, and Sergeant Hinchliffe was in Granier's Catholic Church for morning mass. Ten minutes approximately into the mass, a townsperson runs into the church and says the Germans are attacking. Run for cover, run for your life. Hinchliffe ran out of the church and jumped into action. It was 150 regular German infantry against more than 160 American paratroopers. To preserve his limited ammunition supply, Hinchliffe avoided firing in long bursts. Hinchliffe would pull the trigger in short controlled bursts over a few minutes until he had exhausted one belt of 250 rounds. Then he'd flip up the top cover of the machine gun, lay another belt down in the weapon, close the top cover, rack the bolt, and continue firing. The Nazi commanders had clearly underestimated the size of the American force. They'd done no preliminary bombardment to soften the target and were advancing over open ground. When people are coming en masse across an open field, uh, all you do is just cut loose of the machine gun. With the machine guns providing interlocking fields of fire and mortars raining down from the cemetery, the attacking Germans couldn't get within 100 yards of the perimeter without being torn to shreds. The initial assault was over in 10 minutes. Hinchliffe watched and waited. At 2 p.m., a second wave began. This time, the Germans sent 500 soldiers into battle, but they learned nothing from their first assault, charging like before across open ground. The American gunners decimated them. They ran into this crossfire and we just mowed them down. It was just wholesale slaughter. Again, there was a pause in the action. Time for ammunition to be redistributed and cigarettes to be smoked. 7 p.m. An American observer made an ominous discovery. He spotted two German 105mm howitzers being set up on a hill a few miles away. There was little doubt about what the target for the German guns was. The opening round of this bombardment is one 105 millimeter round placed directly in the belfry of the 12th century Roman Catholic Church. The result was that mortar fire, which had been oh so instrumental in fighting off the first attack and then the second attack, it's basically gone. It's of no contribution whatsoever in holding off the weight of this third attack. German artillery pounded the outgunned Americans. The defense of Granier was beginning to feel like a lost cause, and the American gunners didn't even know the worst of it. The Germans had brought forward two whole battalions of elite Waffen SS Panzer Grenadiers, bringing the total assault force up to 1,500 men. US troops were outnumbered almost 10 to 1. Well trained stormtroopers wouldn't make the mistake of running right up the muzzles of the American machine guns. Using the setting sun as a backdrop to blind the Americans, they began their infantry advance. Rather than charge across the open field, the SS troops used the cover of hedgerows to move forward with speed and stealth. Hinchliffe continued to mow down his attackers, but they just kept coming. Suddenly, commanding officer Major Johnson was killed by an artillery round. Elsewhere along the perimeter, 
the Germans began to overrun the defences. With ammunition running low, acting commander Captain Leroy Brummett decided it was time to get out. His decision, in order to preserve as many lives as possible, was every man for himself, word circulates, and every man runs for his life. Hinchliffe and his assistant gunner Pat Sullivan headed west from the village in the direction of the marsh. When they stopped to rest, Hinchliffe noticed that Sullivan had left behind their two remaining cans of ammunition. Forgot the ammunition. I said, Pat, you forgot the ammunition. He's all caught in the excitement and everything. Well, he apologized for it. And uh, I said, I'll cover me and I'll run back up and get the ammo. Hinchliffe headed back towards the village, leaving his weapon behind. As he bent down to pick up his ammunition, a German jumped out of the hedgerow 80 yards away and started blasting away. And I gave one look at him and started down the hill. And if you've ever had anybody shooting at you, well, you can imagine you're probably making 20 feet to the jump. Bullets flying around you kind of think, well, <laughs> this may be my time. <laughs> Unarmed, Hinchliffe's ammo run had suddenly turned into a dash from death. June the 11th, 1944, Granier, France, 8 p.m. An assault by 1,500 Nazi stormtroopers had driven a force of roughly 160 Americans from this small village. In a hasty retreat, machine gunner John Hinchliffe's assistant left behind two cans of ammunition. Hinchliffe ran back to retrieve the ammo, completely unarmed. A German with an MP40 machine pistol was determined to stop him. With shots hitting all around him, Hinchliffe made a 100-yard dash back to the location where minutes earlier, he'd left his assistant gunner, Patrick Sullivan. He found Sullivan gone. Sullivan had left and taken the 30 caliber machine gun. Luckily, Sullivan had left behind Hinchliffe's M1 carbine. So, of course, it was a simple matter to grab my carbine and whip it around and take out the crowd. He was running down the hill after me. Alone with just two cans of ammunition and his carbine, John Hinchliffe had become an army of one. He decided to make his way around the marsh, out past the village to the north. As I came around the corner, here was my old buddy, Sergeant Charlie Penchard, holding off two Germans who were trying to stick him with their bayonets. Apparently every one of them was out of ammunition, and the two men had cornered Penchard and were probably about to kill him. Hinchliffe knew what to do. Just bang, bang, took the two of them out simple as ABC. Naturally, Charlie was pretty happy to see me. As the Nazis overran Granier, Hinchliffe headed out of town. A few minutes down the road, he caught up with Private Sullivan. I don't remember what I said, but I probably jumped on him, and then he said, I expect you to catch up with me where you've been, and so forth. This was our first combat. There's a lot of anxiety, and he probably wasn't thinking that clearly. He expected me to catch up with him, which I did later on. Not all the Americans were able to retreat safely from Granier. 20 wounded GIs who'd stayed behind suffered a grim fate at the hands of the Germans. They took all our wounded out. They made those that could still do so dig their own grave, then shot them in the head and buried them. We never learned about that until years later. October the 21st, 1944, Vaison, France. 11 p.m. 23 American soldiers were on the move. They had been assigned to the 379th Regimental Combat Scouts, part of the 95th Division of General George S. Patton's 3rd Army. The scouts' mission was to reconnoiter the village, eliminate any resistance, and if possible, bring back prisoners for interrogation. Intelligence reports suggested that only a couple of dozen Germans were in Vaison, holed up in abandoned houses. We blacked our faces. We covered everything, softened everything down. I had my bayonet taped to my barrel so that it wouldn't make any rattle whatsoever. We went in as silently and inconspicuously as we possibly could. When we went out with that many, we were looking for trouble. I mean, we were going to cause trouble. We were out there to eliminate Germans. After a half-mile walk, 
the men approached the northwest corner of Vezon's village square. The scouts were divided into pointmen and a heavy weapons support team. The point, armed with rifles and tommy guns, swept south through the square, checking out the buildings along the west side as they went. The support men stayed in the northwest corner to provide a base of fire for the men ahead. As he watched the point move out, 19-year-old machine gunner Ed Kologi prepared his weapon. We placed the gun at the corner, we put the gun in the cradle, we took off the elevate and traverse mechanism because we wanted the gun to be freewheeling. We were laying on the ground there when all of a sudden a flare went off. With the flare still hanging in the air, the men heard the crackle of a loudspeaker and then what sounded like a pre-recorded voice. That said, men of the 95th, we know you are there. Surrender, and we will take wonderful care of you. We do not want to kill you. We want you to surrender. And we have a warm, comfortable place for you with fine food and maybe some beautiful women. We will return you safely to your wife and mother at the end of the war. It was penetrating voice, which just made the hair stand up in the back of your neck. The scouts, who thought they'd moved in with complete stealth, realized that the Germans knew what unit they were with, and above all, that they were there. They knew we were there. My mother didn't know where I was. Nobody knew where I was. I didn't know where I was. That was pretty scary. Kologi had an answer to the recorded call for surrender. He squeezed his trigger and sent half a belt of ammunition thundering into the night. As the echo from the machine gun rounds simmered, an eerie quiet fell over the square. Heading south, the point split off into two teams. One led by Lieutenant Max Lewis investigated the southwest road. The other, led by 19-year-old Private Jim Thayer, moved east across the southern end of the square, checking out some burnt-out buildings and heading out down the southeast road. Then all of a sudden there was an explosion. I had no idea what was going on. Back in the southwest corner, PFC Bill Knoll had started tossing grenades into suspicious-looking buildings. As he pulled the pin on his fourth grenade, a German Ripper machine gun roared to life. Firing 1,200 rounds per minute, it severed Knoll's throat. He fell face down, the first of the combat scouts to die in battle. He threw one grenade too many, and I think the German chopped him down to keep from getting another grenade in his lap. With some of the men pinned down by the gunner that killed Noel, the rest of the point headed back to the northwest corner of the square to regroup. Thayer maneuvered behind the buildings on the west side to try and outflank the machine gun. The Germans shot up another flare that lit up the entire square. And when the flare went out, I saw a light to my left. When I looked to my left, I saw a German soldier looking at his wristwatch with a flashlight that was on for just the split second that I looked. In that split second, I saw there was a squad of men lined up in back of him. It was terribly dark, but you could still make out, to a degree, the silhouettes of the German squad as it was coming in and around the corner from that side. It was do or die time for the combat scouts. Kologi and Jennings took aim and unleashed a hailstorm of bullets. The Americans were about to show these Germans exactly what time it was. Essentially, like shooting fish in a barrel. So I went ahead and fired three times and three bodies went down and he was coming with a machine gun on the other side. I immediately turned the machine gun to the right, pulled the trigger and sprayed the whole street and took out the whole squad of Germans. The firefight at the north end of the village square had given away Kologi's position and two machine guns opened up on him from buildings to the south. So then the firefight ensued between those two machine guns and me. Kologi knocked out both machine guns. With his adrenaline pumping, 
he held down the trigger and raked the entire square. So I did every door and every window up one side, down the other side, and up this side. The whole square came to life with fire and grenades. Rather than a couple of squads of sleeping Germans, the scouts had rousted an entire Wehrmacht platoon. 22 Americans were shooting it out with 30 to 40 Nazis. Jennings and several other men rushed towards the south side of the square, where a group of scouts were still pinned down. Coming under fire, Jennings hit the ground just like they taught him at infantry school, planting the butt of his rifle to lessen the impact of the fall. But he had hand grenades in his front pockets. And I came down on those hand grenades and the most god-awful Charlie horses. Here I was with my tail sitting up in the air with these hand grenades underneath, and I thought of a comment that was so often made as we went through into the enemy territory, you go out there and get your ass shot off. All right. Jennings jumped up, and by running and ducking in and out of doorways, he made it to the southwest corner of the square. Unseen by Jennings, an enemy gunner appeared in the second story window with an MP40 machine pistol. And suddenly a tremendous shock. I felt as though I was catcher on a baseball team, and the batter, instead of hitting the ball, hit me right square in the forehead. Just bang. Jennings had taken a bullet to the head and was knocked cold. When I came to, the whole area was bathed in light. Fantastic, brighter than, oh, a huge searchlight. The Germans had sent up another flare and it was bobbing in the air on a parachute. And I put my hand down and it was just full of blood. There was just a, a mass of bleeding coming out of the corner of the forehead and the eye socket area in there. The bullet was lodged in Jennings' eye socket. He knew that if the flare didn't go out soon, it would be no problem for the German that shot him to finish him off. Jennings' prayers were answered when Lieutenant Max Lewis shot the flare out of the sky. As Jennings evacuated to the other side of the square, one of his mates took revenge on the German that shot him. Jennings took refuge in a coal hole, waiting for the firing to die down. In the meantime, the order came to withdraw. Eventually I was told, we're obviously not going to catch anybody, we're going to withdraw. So everybody that was around me withdrew. The scouts headed out of the village, fighting as they went. Fearing he'd be captured if he stayed behind, Jennings climbed out of his hiding place. With a deep breath and a constant prayer, I ran right across that town square, just as hard as I could go. There were bullets in front of me, there were bullets behind me, there were bullets through my pants legs, and I made it. The scouts had taken no prisoners. One of their men had been killed and two seriously wounded. But they had nearly wiped out an entire enemy platoon of 30 to 40 men, and they considered the mission an incredible feat. They knew we were coming. They had a squad on the left, a squad on the right. They had us surrounded. They had people in front of us with two machine guns. They had a flare, and they were telling us we should surrender, so they knew they outsmarted us. They had us trapped, but we fought our way out of it. Consensus later was that we'd screwed up the patrol so badly that we were successful. It was a successful mess. The morning after the shootout at Vazon, Ed Kologi was walking along the American lines when he saw a man approaching. Leather bomber jacket, ivory handled pistols. There on the battlefield was General George S. Patton. October the 22nd, 1944, Array, France. 
morning. It had only been a matter of hours since combat scout Ed Kologi saved 21 men in his unit from certain slaughter in the Vezon village square. The machine gunner's quick action eliminated an entire German squad. Back behind American lines, he was surprised to see General George S. Patton strolling across the front. Informed of their heroics on the first night of combat, Patton had come to personally award the men their combat infantryman badges. When he came to me, he said, how many of them did you kill? I said, well, I don't know, but they tell me they took 30 bodies out of there and I may be credited with them. And he said, well, that's that many of the bastards won't reproduce. September the 12th, 1944, Pousset, France, 60 miles south of Vaison. A nameless hill, a barely significant rise in the land. But in the battle for France, any high ground was turf worth fighting for. The Germans were fighting a defensive war for the most part at this stage in the game. And when the Germans fought a defensive war, they did so with expert style. To the 100 men of G Company, 313th Infantry, 79th Division, taking this hill looked easy, and that's just what over 100 Germans wanted them to think. Beneath a perfect camouflage of brush and branches, the defenders of the Reich were dug in with at least seven machine gun bunkers, numerous foxholes, and even a pillbox made of logs. Before assaulting the hill, the Americans wisely decided to probe the German defenses. Four scouts were culled forward. It was the scout's job to locate the enemy and then make the enemy announce his presence by firing. Unfortunately for the scouts, that usually meant that they were being fired at. They were oftentimes being wounded and or killed by this enemy fire. The first two scouts moved out in tandem. Once they were out 200 yards, a second pair followed. German machine gunners opened up from hidden positions at the edge of the wooded hill, cutting two of them down. One took a bullet to the leg, snapping the bone, as another round slammed into his back. He dropped to the ground in agony. The second scout screamed in pain from being hit across the face, and instinctively made a move back towards the tree line. Responding to the gunfire was 27-year-old platoon leader, Brian Bell. He had his men provide covering fire as the injured scout crawled to safety. I can remember seeing the blood coming down into his eyes. The scout with the leg and back wounds writhed in pain in the middle of the field. He started calling out, Dick, that was his squad leader. Dick, I'm getting me. I'm hit. I'm hit bad, Dick, come get me. And we were just, oh, just lying there, knowing there was nothing I could do. With a couple of the enemy positions identified, Preparations were made for the assault, but an observer surveying the hill through his binoculars made a fortunate discovery. The branches being used to camouflage the German positions had dried and yellowed in the sun, clearly revealing all seven of the machine gun positions and the log pillbox. That observer said to the captain, if we try to cross there with the machine guns we have now identified, it's going to be slaughter. And the captain agreed with him. Captain Dusty Rhodes informed the men that the attack had been postponed until tomorrow, when heavy artillery and reinforcements could be moved into position, so the men dug in for the night. Dusty says, well, we're going to give them hell tomorrow. September the 13th, 9.20 a.m. At this late point in the war, the Americans had developed a standard procedure for assaulting a heavily defended hill. It always began with an extended artillery barrage. It was hoped that all German defenders there 
would either be killed or so stunned by firepower that when the infantry and the armor began moving up that hill to sweep over the objective, those enemy would not be able to put up much of a fight. At the base of the hill, Lieutenant Bell prepared his men for the attack. There was no philosophizing or even predicting, oh boy, that hill looks terrible or anything. We just uh, saw what it was. Each of us saw what it was. We were waiting for commands. We were hopeful. We realized the risk. But you're in the infantry. 10 a.m. Once the artillery stopped, Lieutenant Bell and two companies of American GIs would move straight up the hill where they'd make a direct assault on the dug-in German forces. Just before the men moved out, the artillery sent up a barrage of smoke shells, creating a screen in front of the Germans. I guess I could say I never was so pleased to see anything in my whole life because I knew it was concealing us from them because the guys couldn't see more than four feet ahead of them. Two companies of GIs left their foxholes and moved up the hill. Some of the men fired from the hip as they went, while others stopped to take hasty aim. The smoke screen left the Germans to fire wildly. One American was hit in the chest and went down. Another had his leg shattered. In the surreal, smoky landscape, the Germans were routed. Lieutenant Bell approached a foxhole and saw a German cowering. A GI stepped forward and killed him. As the Americans swept up the hill, they found that the artillery had done its job. Those Germans that hadn't been killed had abandoned the ground to fight another day. In a textbook infantry attack, the nameless hill had been taken. Still, no flags were planted or celebrations planned. No, we didn't celebrate. We had lost friends. For Lieutenant Bell and all the infantrymen of the US Army, it was just another day, another hill, another shootout. The storming of France was one of the most lethal campaigns of the Second World War. And for the infantrymen who fought there, the horrors of brutal combat continue to haunt them. We were overseas fighting. I mean, the enemy was there, and uh, so to speak, you'd go on a killing spree. I mean, you were killing people. And I killed lots of people. And that's something that, that uh, affects your brain a little bit, I believe. This is the burden of the men who fought to drive back the Nazis. But they realized that the bullets they shot and took helped bring the war to an end. I'm proud because I think I was one of several million people who saved a civilization. And that's, that's good enough. It was absolutely necessary. It's just uh, it's a fight you had to fight. How do I feel about it? I'm glad I did it.